I have tons of questions for you, but I think the place I have to start is I, I have a hard time calling you Reese because Why? when I see you, I think of Tracy Flick and Elle <laughs> Woods and June Carter and Cheryl Strayed and all these iconic fictional and real characters you've played. Aww. And I think what, what that speaks to for me is how deep you go into your characters. I feel like you've become these people and I feel like Elle Woods and Tracy Flick are real people. I kind of feel like I know them. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's so cool to hear. I think well, they're real people too. I get very invested. So I would love to hear about how you get into these characters. What do you do to begin getting to know the ones who never existed and also the ones who did? Well, I have to. I think I have to go backwards and say that I was just such an avid reader as a little girl. So from my grandma taught me to read when I was around five. She was a school teacher, but she just picked me up from school every single day and read to me with lots of different voices of each character. So I learned to read in a way that was very expressive and immersive. So as an early reader, I just tore through books and I was always looking for really interesting character voices. So to me, I always start with unique character traits um, what makes this person tick, right? How do they walk? How do they behave? Where did they grow up is a huge piece of it. Birth order, um, socioeconomic status. And then I start working on regional accents and um, layering things like how do they hold their hands and how do they walk? Um, and it's a very private process for me. I really don't share it with a lot of people. I didn't go to acting school. Um, so it's really just comes from my imagination. And I think that's why I'm so interior about it. It's hard sometimes to tell directors what choices I'm going to make. Um, I try to be generous about it, but I also try to be as spontaneous as possible because I think that's what creates a uh, real listening behavior between two actors. Part of the reason I'm curious about this is we all have to become people we're not in everyday life. Mm -hmm. And for me, this is a huge part of professionalism, right? Is mm -hmm. to say, okay, uh, I'm a shy introvert and I have to show up on stage or in a podcast interview as mm -hmm. somebody a little different from that. And if I were a better actor, it would have taken me a lot less time to get comfortable doing it. <laughs> so so what, what should I have known? Oh, well, creating character is just about how you want to present yourself to the world, right? So with with as much authenticity as possible. So look, you're doing fine, Adam. Everybody loves you. <laughs> but, you know, it's, I think how we show up is is sort of a mixture of social norms and then also what we want to expect of ourselves and what is expected of us inside the environment, our work environment. So if you can hit that sweet spot and it makes it feel authentic to you and you can really show up at work and feel seen and heard, um, but also remember it's work, right? You gotta show up, you gotta be professional. It's not therapy, <laughs> it's work. Um, I think that's the that's the sweet spot. So your comment about authenticity reminds me of the, the classic work in sociology and now bridged into psychology around surface versus deep acting. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure you've heard these terms before, but when I think about surface acting, I think about basically putting on a mask and mm -hmm. trying to pretend to be someone you're not. And deep acting is much more like method acting, where mm. I try to feel internally what I want to project to the outside world. And I, I'm curious about how you how you adopt those modes in your work. Um, are you are you fully on deep acting? Um, are there moments when you're just trying to to kind of portray the image, but you're not feeling it inside? It was so interesting. I was talking to an acting student yesterday, and he was telling me he's having a hard time accessing his emotions. And I said, you know, so much of acting is just listening and behaving how a, your character would behave. And if you know implicitly who your character is, um, you're going to listen and respond the way you should. But it comes from doing the work, the pre-work, which is that's not surface stuff. It's really deep stuff. If you grew up in Beverly Hills and you grew up very wealthy and you were able to have spending money as a teenager, you're going to act different than a kid who grew up in Omaha and with a single mom and not knowing if you're going to get a new pair of sneakers that year or the next year. And that you know, if you don't work hard and use every advantage, you're never going to get ahead. So those are just two completely different mentalities. And if you know that about your character walking in, you can make any kind of decision. It's really actually, it makes it so much easier. But I think 
you got to do the pre-work. It's, it's about prep. Can you walk me through what that pre-work looked like? What were some of the things that you did to get to know Elle Woods' character? Okay, so Elle Woods, that's interesting. So she grew up in an upper middle class, well, probably upper class, I would say, family. And then she went to um, private high schools. And so I actually ended up going down to USC and visiting a girlfriend of mine who was in a sorority and lived in the sorority for four years. And I went down every day and I sat with her during the day while she was getting ready um, for going out. And then I would also have dinner with the girls or I would take them out and we would talk about um, what were their life goals? What did they really want to accomplish? What was next for them? And then the other thing that I did just to get sort of the posturing of the character is I went to <laughs> this fancy um, department store in Beverly Hills, Neiman Marcus, and I watched women try on shoes. I looked at their nails. I looked at the color of their hair. And then I would watch how they would walk in certain different kinds of shoes and how they held their hands when they walk and how they spoke to people. And if it was clipped, if it was kind, it was unkind. And I don't know, just all those little micro behaviors add up to a performance that is just from a place that she felt confident, but somehow she was entering a new world and she got kicked, you know, and suddenly her confidence was shaken and she had imposter syndrome, even though she had every reason to be there. Um, everybody was making her feel like she didn't belong. And how you get that confidence back is all up to you, right? So it came from inside her. Last time we talked, you said, sometimes it's helpful to think about your own life as a movie. And that helps you figure out what story to tell, what speech to give, what moment to hone in on. And you said something about how if you were making my biopic, which should never be made, it would open <laughs> with, with me standing on the end of the diving board shaking. Yeah. So I was wondering if if we could resuscitate that and have yeah. you articulate what was it that stood about stood out about that moment? Why is this a useful exercise? And then I have some follow up questions on it. Oh, I mean, it's so fun because I love your book, Think Again. And when I was reading it, you talk about being a diver, and I thought that was such a great visual metaphor too, because how many times do we feel like we're standing at the edge of a high dive, and you're like, I can't do it, I can't do it. And there are people who would say, well, screw it. I'm going to do it anyway. And there's people who go, I just can't. And they'll turn around and walk back down the ladder and off the platform. So I thought, that's the beginning of your movie to me. Um, but I think about pinnacle moments in people's lives and how we have all had these moments of big decisions and crossroads and how they define us. And we don't know what they are, right? Until we get to the full picture of what your life journey has been. Um, but I think in terms of when I hear people talking, I'm like, no, that's your story. Because everybody has to learn to tell their story. I don't care who you are, where you're from. If you're a small business owner, you need to learn how to tell your story, whether it's on social media, to, to for marketing. You're going to have to tell your story and you tell it in a compelling way and find the parts that really resonate with people. Find those touchstones that are like the every person experience. Is it where you grew up? Is it how much you love this, this project that you're so passionate about? Why? Everybody wants to know why. So I think I'm real. I get very invested in helping people tell their stories in the most effective way. One of the things I thought was so profound about that was <clears throat> when you when you pose this, you know, okay, which kind of person are you? Are you the person who is going to take the leap, or are you going to be the person who climbs back down? Mm. I'm neither. Oh. <laughs> I, I I was terrified to take the leap. I was afraid of heights. I didn't want to crash all over the pool. It hurt. I didn't want to get lost in midair. Mm -hmm. But I also completely refused to get off the board. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was not going to leave practice until I did it. And so I felt like I was frozen in this point of ambivalence. And I didn't think of it until you described this moment and, and painted the scene for me. Um, what, what finally would get me to go was the threat of having to get off the board and walk down the ladder. And I, I was so determined to not be that person mm -hmm. that it sort of forced me then to, I guess, <laughs> to be more courageous than I, than I was. Wow. Well, look at that. The fear of regret. <laughs> it's huge. It's powerful. Yeah. I was afraid of regretting not doing it. I was afraid of letting my coach down. And that fear was stronger than the fear of, you know, of flailing and, and smacking. I like that too. 
do what you said you were going to do, you know, and you said you were going to do it, go do it. What are those, those moments of, I'm afraid of trying, but I'm also afraid of not trying look like for you? I mean, every movie I've ever done is like, am I going to be able to do this? I mean, the ones that really come up for me are walk the line because playing a real person, I had to sing. I had to perform instruments that I had to learn how to play. Every day I wanted to quit. Every day I'd have pit in my stomach thinking, oh, I'm going to be terrible. I'm going to have to get up on this stage in front of hundreds of people and I'm going to sound awful or I'm not going to be able to do it. Oh, I tried every way. I called my lawyer. I was like, get me out of this. I told the director I can't do it anymore. Are you like, serious? Just, oh my gosh, Wait, yes. This is this is the role that you won the Oscar for. Yes. You wanted to quit. <laughs> I wanted to quit. Seven months of rehearsals and um, probably every day. I, I mean, I cried so much during rehearsals. I was just scared. I was scared about not being good enough. Um, and then I realized I had to be the best I could be. I was never going to be June Carter Cash. I was never going to be a perfect musician. I was never going to play the auto harp perfectly or the guitar perfectly. I was just going to show up and do the very best of my ability. and. There was a reason somebody thought I could do it. And I was not, I was not going to give up trying. I'll always try. So uh, that first performance, the first time we did it, Joaquin and I were together in, uh, we were in Memphis on this little stage. Oh my God, it was terrifying. There were 200 extras just staring at us. And I thought I was going to throw up. <laughs> but I got out there and I was like, just do it, Reese. Just do it. 